computer. There we go. All right. Hi, everybody. Dana here. Uh, it is my pleasure, my honor. I'm so excited to introduce you to um, Poppy. And she is a beagle who uh, is very sweet and just got fixed. So she's a little bit clingy, but she is very sweet. And she's the luckiest dog in the world because she, um, her, her human, as we like to say, um, is Dan Billingsley, who is a good friend of mine and a colleague um, and one of the, I would say, top nonprofit consultants in the state of Oklahoma, if not in the nation. So we are very lucky to have him join us for this class. He um, has a, a wealth of experience in the nonprofit world um, in fundraising, marketing, public relations, um, music. <laughs> um, then he's also, um, and I know we've talked about the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits, and uh, because you guys took one, you know, one of the uh, packets from there is one of the things that you guys looked at on how to start a nonprofit. Um, he worked at the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits for years and years, was the number two guy there, um, ran a lot of stuff there. And he is right now um, finishing up a doctorate uh, in, remind me, Organizational development and community okay. health. That's it. I knew that's what it was. Um, <laughs> I just want to give you a chance to talk. Um, then, uh, but he also just started a uh, a company, a consulting company, doing all kinds of really cool things. And I want him to tell you a little bit about that. But Dan, is there anything else that you want to tell the class about you and your experiences and what you're doing right now? No, uh, I, you, you, you nailed it. So, uh, but no, I'm really glad to be here, Dana, and I'm uh, really glad to talk to your class, but also, you know, be a potential resource for all of you as you're, you know, embarking on these careers, uh, because as Dana will tell you, as I will tell you, most of us did not go to college saying, oh, we're going to work for a nonprofit. Um, there is a lot of ending up there, but uh, in many respects, I think nonprofits find us, we don't find them. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that today. I agree. I agree totally. Tell, tell them about your company that you just started and what you're doing and how you're helping nonprofits. Yeah. So uh, my background is, you know, I was a marketing guy for a long time and I worked for nonprofits and I was working in arts administration. I actually have a, a background in performing arts and opera and um, doing a lot of, you know, that day-to-day -day marketing work. And at the time I was kind of a techie geek and I knew how to use a computer, which was great uh, skill set back in, you know, 1998 or 2000, because back then computers were these giant, bizarre looking, you know, monitors and people didn't know what to do with them. And suddenly I could come in and say, hey, I, I can work this. Uh, but I, I later went back to school to get a degree in public relations. And so I have a master's degree from University of Kansas in journalism. And um, soon after that, I ended up working actually in um, mental health care. And I was doing, I started as a marketing person, but this was around 2008, the Great Recession. And just because we were losing a lot of staff, a lot of capacity, I started doing a lot more fundraising, uh, and I really got heavily involved in government relations and advocacy around uh, uh, mental health care. So I, I came to uh, Oklahoma 10 years ago, and uh, at the Center for Nonprofits, I was doing a lot of consulting work. Uh, I was doing uh, a lot of training around fundraising, also overseeing fundraising, marketing, and our government affairs work. Um, but uh, last year, I had the opportunity to work with a couple of uh, contract clients and started my own business, which is called Charisma Strategy Partners. And, and the uh, nonprofit arm of that is called Mission Charisma. And, and my, my motto is be great at doing good. And one of the things you'll hear a lot here in Oklahoma, I mean, my mentor, Marnie Taylor, always used the uh, great John Wesley quote, which was do all the good you can. And, and most of you are gonna see this. I mean, it is really the quote that, that signifies the nonprofit sector. But a good friend of mine who is a Tulsa legend herself, uh, Sharon Gallagher, who worked for United Way, yeah. said, in order to do good, you have to be good. Mm -hmm. And so my intention with my work is to make sure that organizations 
are are really great at what they do because all of our missions are so important. But at the end of the day, we've got to have strong boards. We've got to have a good staff. We've got to have engaged leaders, you know, and and uh, great volunteers. And that takes work. And as you're learning in this class, you know, nonprofit is merely a tax status. And I like to tell people what you're really running is a tax exempt corporation uh, in the eyes of the law. So. Yeah. My motto, you know, for my business is be great at doing good, because the fact is, in order for us to do good, we've got to really have our ducks in a row. Absolutely. Um, I love what you've said, and I love that you talked about Marnie Taylor, because I did actually quote her, and I hope that it's a verbatim quote. It's something I heard her say once, and I picked up, and I use it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it is that, you know, show me a problem in a nonprofit. And I will show you how it's a problem with governance. That's exactly right. And that's a lot of what we're talking about this week mm -hmm. um, is governance issues. And so mm -hmm. um, do you have in your, I, I mean, I'm sure you have 9 million horror stories. <laughs> You've seen it all. Um, but can you give an example of a time when there was an issue in a nonprofit and obviously don't name any names that from the outside, any lay person would not have realized that was a governance issue, but at the heart of it, it really was. Can you think of anything? Yeah, I, I do have a good story. And actually, this is a this is a, a really good turnaround story, and it's a public story good. that that I, that I want to tell. Um, I I work really closely, and I have for about six years with a rare disease organization. And this organization is global in nature, uh, but it's based here in Tulsa. Uh, but for, for almost six years, the entire board uh, comprised parents who had lost their children or were in the process of losing their children to a really horrible genetic disease. Yeah. And um, all of them obviously came with this unbelievable trauma and lived experience. And as a board of directors, uh, they were frankly struggling. I, they were struggling to be able to make decisions. They were struggling to get along. Uh, they were struggling to, um, you know, do things that were uh, within their own capacity. Because imagine this, raising kids is hard enough. Imagine raising a child with special needs that you know is probably going to die. Right. Um, and so they're, they're dealing with trauma. It, it is. It's absolute trauma. And one of the things yeah. that that for all of us in the nonprofit world, there are two things right now. I think we all have to be better informed about one is diversity, equity, inclusion, and the other is trauma, because those are the two things that are having probably the most effect on nonprofit organizational development. So this organization, I started working with them in 2016. They're. Um, Director is a woman here in Tulsa named Melissa Bryce, who you've got to meet. She is a dynamo. She calls me her mentor. I call her my, you know, beacon of hope. So, you know, we, we just had this really beautiful relationship. But I, when I got in to talk to this board, I said, you have to start diversifying. And when I say diversifying, you're going to have to find people who are not necessarily affected by this disease. Right. Because when one of you needs to tap out because you've got a sick kid or you are dealing with grief, et cetera, et cetera, there have to be professionals in place in order to keep this organization running. That's the important part of this mission. So this was not a horror story at all. In fact, it was a story of once this organization started looking at its board with a little bit more professionalism. Let me tell you, this organization just passed a $900,000 budget this year. This organization is getting ready to invest a million dollars into uh, an investment account to have some money for uh, scientific research. This organization is working with a pharmaceutical company and a venture capitalist to potentially push 50 to $100 million into specific clinical trials. So, when, when I say, you know, you've got to look at your board um, and, and Marnie says, you know, there's no problem that doesn't point back to governance. Yeah. 
Uh, this is absolutely the truth. We've got to really focus on strong boards and strong board governance because every organization I've seen that has succeeded, it's because of great leadership and a great board. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's a great answer. And I love that story. Um, another uh, area that I do want to ask you about, and we talked about a little bit about this before we got started is, uh, you know, I, I, I like to quote people as do you. And, uh, you know, I have that quote from Marnie Taylor. I also have my quote from Dan Billingsley, which is the world absolutely positively does not need another 501c3. So. Yeah. And, and <laughs> you know, here, is what I'm gonna, here is what I'm going to say as I qualify that statement. Yes. Um, I just, and, and Dana's probably shared with you the data. There are more than 20,000 registered nonprofit corporations in the state of Oklahoma. But when you whittle things down and you take out churches and you take out country yeah. clubs and you take out associations and you take out nonprofits that have zero budget, right. there are only about 3,000 left. And if you take out small budgets, meaning under $100,000, there are only 1,500 nonprofits. Um, in Tulsa County, there are really only about 400 nonprofits here that have a budget of $100,000 or more. There are only 220 nonprofits uh, doing social services. Um, what that means is it's not that we need more nonprofits, it's that we need to push more resources into the nonprofits that are already doing the great work that they're doing. Um, I, I have said some controversial things in the past about yeah. particularly philanthropic mean, and yeah, <laughs> never. But you know, one of the things that, that in the future is going to have to happen for nonprofits to really do their job and do their job well is philanthropists to kind of get off their backs, um, give more unrestricted money, fund more innovation, fund more business, fund more entrepreneurial spirit in nonprofits. Um, we also have to start paying people better. Yeah. Nonprofits are notorious for uh, bad salaries. And you know what? I know it feels good to be part of a mission. I know it feels good to volunteer. Uh, they may have decent benefits, but at the end of the day, that doesn't pay the bills. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, you will see a number of uh, articles that I've shared or written about how we need to be better about funding our nonprofit salaries. And it is not overhead. Remember, salaries are not overhead. Uh, you, you know, a, a social worker is not overhead. A social worker is there to deliver your programs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I say we don't need another 501c3, if we're going to have another 501c3, it's got to be one that is doing something different than other people are already doing. It's got to be something that directly meets a need. Uh, for instance, this rare disease nonprofit, there was yeah. nothing out there. Yeah, and there's nothing out even, there. Yeah, nothing. And yeah. even though this disease only affects one in 50,000 births, you know, right now they're that's, working. That's with, actually kind of a lot. It, yeah, we're working with close to 700 families around the world, and we think that's only 10% of the families actually affected by the disease. So, you know, I and I use them as an example, but I also use things like food banks as an example. We have some of the greatest food banks in the country right here in Oklahoma, and it kills me when somebody says, I want to start a food bank. What they need to do is go work with ours or, you know, fund ours or help with one of the rural food banks that are part of the connection uh, here in Oklahoma. So when, when I say don't just start a 501c3, what I really mean is if, if somebody is out there doing it and doing it well, you know, volunteer for them, work for them, fund them. You know, that's, that's what we need to do to keep uh, these organizations thriving. Wow. Oh, I could that you just said everything. Um, <laughs> everything I hoped you would say. How to have ah, that's awesome. I love it. So talk if you don't mind, and I don't want to keep you too long, but I do want to pick your brain because I think it'll really help um, the students mm -hmm. and have that perspective and know that there really are careers to be made, um, successful careers in the non in the nonprofit sector. Um, 
but I would love for you to touch a little bit more on, you know, you talked about needing those two things, kind of best practices or, you know, mm -hmm. um, having a good board and then also the diversity, equity and, and inclusion. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's that's what we're talking about next week. That's our module. And so I would love to get your perspective on that, on how do you define that? I mean, I know that there are kind of textbook definitions, but mm. how would you define that? How do you see, because you and I have both walked into board meetings where it's 13 white dudes over the age of 50. Um, and so when you walk into one of those organizations, um, how do you make, talk about, just talk. Yeah. Go. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about being trauma informed and, and I would highly recommend all of you start getting to understand trauma, how it has an effect on everything we personally do, and actually how as organizations it affects us. But the other thing is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you will hear people use this term called buzzword board. This is not a buzzword. Diversity, equity, inclusion is the result of decades and decades and decades of systemic racism, systemic oppression, that is in you know, every single facet of our society. And you know, this is a hard conversation to have and it makes people uncomfortable. And I really like making people uncomfortable with this conversation. But you know, I, I, was, I was talking yesterday with an organization who is very seriously thinking about creating a diversity and inclusion committee at the board level. And we had some, we had some really candid conversations about that because at first they thought maybe it should just be a subcommittee of governance or maybe this is an HR issue. And I said, here's the thing. We have a lot of nonprofits, a lot of corporations out there. You're gonna see lots of these titles, chief diversity officer, chief inclusion officer, et cetera. Until we focus on diversity, equity, inclusion at the board level, at the organizational level, and even more importantly, at the systemic level, it doesn't matter if you put somebody in to fix your HR issues, okay? Right. Because if your board is all what we call pale, male, and stale, and I'm getting there, but if your board is all of that, and in nonprofits, by the way, now it's uh, pale, female, and stale, yeah, right. uh, because we have just, a, a, it's a very female-dominated industry. But when we look at diversity, we have to look at everything from, yes, skin color, ethnicity, and religion, but we need to look at socioeconomic status. We need to look at uh, gender and people who are non-gender affirming. Uh, we need to look at ableism. I mean, how many times have you walked in a room where the person with different abilities is sitting in a different part of the room because they can't figure out a way to get them included into the room. So, you know, looking at looking at all of these different things, looking at geography, you know, I, I, I see a lot of uh, statewide boards. I serve on the statewide board and we really talk about geography because we need to know what's happening in Lawton. We need to know what's happening in Durant. We need to know what's happening in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. So if you're statewide, you really need all of that perspective. Uh, when it comes to racial diversity, you know, one of the things I tell folks is um, getting people included uh, is a lot harder than they think. Um, and I was, I was with a board a couple of weeks ago, we were doing a, a personality assessment and we were talking about, uh, you know, gold type personalities, very rule driven and, and needing a lot of order, et cetera. And I said, okay, here's the thing. If you're in a boardroom and a white male or a white female starts talking about order and rules and why aren't we following this? they look like they're being incredibly organized. But if that were a black woman who's an attorney, all of a sudden, you know, she may appear quote unquote aggressive or, you know, pushing the boundaries that we don't need to be. So, so yeah. I, I always say that, you know, if we're gonna look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to focus on the last word, which is inclusion. And the last thing I'll say about this is inclusion means that everyone is sharing power equally. And when you are a historically excluded um, 
population, whether it's black or Latino or LGBT, whatever it may be, if you are historically excluded and you are in a position of power in your community, you're not going to give up power very quickly. Right. All right. Yeah. Just like pale, male and stale, you're yeah. not going to want to give up power. So inclusion is sharing power. And, you know, those power dynamics are a bit more nuanced than we think they are, but nonprofits are going to have to figure out how do we allow people in an organization, whether it's in a charitable nonprofit, whether it's in a foundation, whether it's, you know, philanthropic, whatever it is, how are we going to share power together? So, you know, that's what I would say. And Dana, I will make sure and send you a link uh, for your students. They can watch. There was an hour conversation uh, led by Kuma Roberts and Yvonne Davis here in Tulsa. And Allison Anthony is with the United Way. She was on it. And Marcia Bruno Todd with Leadership Tulsa was on it. And, and we were talking about how to avoid tokenism of diversity on board specifically. So I will send you that link. You. It, it's 45 minutes, but it, it is a fantastic conversation uh, from some real leaders in the community about how hard it is uh, to create a sense of inclusion in a nonprofit. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's marvelous. So um, I, like I said, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you have a million things to do. So let me just wrap it up by asking, is there anything, let's say three things, if you, you know, you can probably name off a thousand, but uh, this is an introduction to nonprofit organizations. So if there were just a handful of things that people really needed to know about the nonprofit world, mm -hmm, what would they be? Um, be very diligent and deliberate in everything you do. Just because this is a nonprofit, again, you're, you're, it's a corporation. So we have to run it like a business. Um, and so we have to exercise our duty of care in doing it. Um, the second piece is always have a sense of humor uh, because there are going to be things. I, my friend and I are, are going to write a book called Not in My Job Description. And, you know, someday Dana and I will actually do a stand up act for everybody about all the things that are not in our job description that we have had to do. I mean, yeah. and I can tell you they have involved you know, old ladies taking them to church all the way to dead mice, you know, and, and we've all got those stories. So have a oh, sense yeah. of humor. The <laughs> third thing I would say is always put your mission first. And I'll be candid. If you're not into the mission, move on. Uh, one of the things I tell donors, uh, wow. and, and I, I, I tell them all the time, it's, it's like, look, don't feel compelled to give because somebody gives you a sob story. If you're not into this mission, that's that's okay. Uh, I will tell you the board I serve on is probably, you know, it's not a food bank, it's not children. It, it is literally a statewide coalition of policy geeks who get together, 150 of us in a wow. casino hotel, you know, to discuss some esoteric policy issue like the state budget or voting rights, or last year it was mental health. This year it's going to be economic development. That is not everybody's cup of tea, right. but it's mine. Yeah. And all of you have a cup of tea. So really put that forward and don't try to fit yourself into a box that you know you're never going to fit in. That is gorgeous. Thank you. You bet. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording so you and I can dish a little bit more. So I'll see you in a second. <laughs>